Today we're talking about on the incarnation of the word of God. And on the incarnation is a beloved book. Of course, we're all quite familiar with it. Um, I recommend that you guys get a copy for yourselves as well. On the incarnation is made up of 57 paragraph uh, paragraphs. Each paragraph is really small, about a page or even less. Um, it begins by the first paragraph is is only a summary and an introduction, a summary of the previous book and an introduction into the book. So he says, in a former book, we have established the following. The word of the Father is divine. All things owe their being to his power. Through him, the Father gives order to the creation, and by him, all things receive their being. The first book is called On the Incarnation. Uh, sorry, it's called Against the Heathens. This is On the Incarnation. Now he says, we must take a step further in the faith and consider the, the words becoming man and his appearing in our midst, which is really the point of this book, is understanding why the word had to become man with the word here capital w is, is god the logos so why did god have to become man and why did he have to appear and take a body and to to be born on earth he says we must understand why the word of the father being great has been manifest in body form why god took a body even though he is great um he has not assumed a body fitting of his nature and by being he's great meaning that he is lowering himself taking a body uh, of his creation he has manifested appeared in a human body out of love and goodness for his father and salvation for us all we will begin with the creation and the first fact that we must understand is that the renewal of the creation must be done or was done by the same god who created it in the beginning? What, what is he saying here? He's saying simply that if this camera breaks, I have to take it to the people that make this camera to fix it. They're going to be the only people and the best people to understand it and to fix it. My phone breaks. I'm going to take it to the manufacturer, the company that sells that phone, not their competitor and not someone else. And so he's saying pretty much the same thing. Who is who is able to fix the creation it is only the same person who made something it is only god who made the creation who's able to fix it from chapters 2 to 10 we're going to speak about something called the divine dilemma regarding death and life and pretty much he there is going to be a dilemma a dilemma is a hard question so it's going to be the divine dilemma regarding death and life and then after that, from chapters 11 to 19, there's going to be the divine dilemma regarding ignorance and knowledge. And each one of those, St. Anthonius is going to take us through a path from creation into the reason that Christ had to come down and to be incarnate. And then again, he's going to start all over again and find another reason for us that God had to come down into our world and be incarnate. So starting from paragraph 2, he says, let us talk about the different opinions about creation. He says, in his time, there are about two different or three different opinions about creation. And unfortunately, the first one still exists around in our time today, which is what, um, what many people refer to as the theory of evolution. Pretty much, he says, the idea is that all things are self-originated and haphazard. Things are quite random. And they just happen on their own without a creator. And this denies that there is a mind behind the universe at all. And if this happens, all things, he says, would be in this automatic fashion, that all things would be uniform. Everything would be a sun or a moon. Everything in a body would be an eye or a foot. He says, however, the distinctness of things points to not a spontaneous but an eternal and prevenient cause he's saying wait a second the fact that things are not 
the same. The things are different and unique and distinct points to not something spontaneous and random, but something that is laid out and thought out. And he says it has been thought out before time. Prevenient is before time and eternal. Paragraph two, or no, not paragraph two. We're still in paragraph two. The second idea about creation is some people say God created or not created. God made things out of pre-existent matter, just as a carpenter makes things out of wood that already exists. And this would put limitation on God, just like a carpenter cannot make anything if he has no access to it. This describes a craftsman and not a creator. In paragraph three, he then establishes that God must have made the universe out of nothing. Why did God have to make the universe out of nothing? Because if you look at the last point, if God made things out of pre-existent matter, this would put a limitation on God, meaning that he is unable to be God. Because God, by design, by the definition, by the understanding of the word, must be the best, the strongest, the fastest. You know, if you guys understand what I'm trying to say. Meaning that if I say I have the fastest computer in the world, that means it cannot be beaten. And the day another computer that's faster than it comes on the market, it no longer holds that title. And so God, by definition, by our basic understanding, cannot have any limitation because any limitation would make him not God in the first place. And so from paragraph three, we move on from the premise that God made the universe out of nothing. And he comes back and asks, why did God make the universe? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? And he says, because he is good and he did not hold back his goodness. That they would not endure eternally, he granted his creation a second gift to be made in his image. Number one, God created the universe. Number two, God created man. Number three, God gave man or humanity another gift that they are made in his image. Now, again, God gives humanity a law or God gives Adam and Eve the law. And this law is, is up to them. So it introduces free choice. Either they live with God or they don't. And this is up to them. If they guard the grace and remain good, then they will have life in paradise. But if they transgress and turn away to wickedness, then they will reap corruption, death, and they will no longer live in paradise and death here not simply is to die but to remain in corruption of death and so here's the recap first god creates the universe god creates man in his image god gives them the law and this now grants them free choice and the possibility of evil and death now we know that death comes about and this brings about corruption. In paragraph four, he says, you may be wondering why we are talking about creation when the intention is to talk about the incarnation. And simply, we are starting from creation because it is linked. And the reason for the incarnation happened all the way in the creation of Adam and Eve. And there has been a link to save it ever since. The reasons for the incarnation is out of his great love for our salvation and our sorry case. Paragraph four, God created man in incorruption. Instead of remaining in this state, they were in the process of becoming corrupted. When they lost the knowledge of God, they lost all existence with it because it is God alone who exists and evil is not being the negation of God. What does this mean? Basically and simply, just like darkness is not a force and does not exist, but simply it is the absence of light. So death is also the absence 
of life and the source of all life is God. So, so the source of all existence is God. And now to be unhinged from God, unlinked to God, is simply to be non-existent. Paragraph 5, not only did God create man out of nothing, but he granted us to live according to God. But human beings turning away from the things eternal by the counsel of the devil, now this led to death and corruption. There is a verse in Wisdom chapter 2, it says, For God created man to be immortal, and he made him in the image of his own likeness. But by the envy of the devil, death entered into the world. It's quite similar to the prayer of reconciliation in the St. Basil liturgy. For, o God, the great, the eternal, who formed man in incorruption, and death entered into the world through the envy of the devil, you have destroyed by the life-giving manifestation of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In paragraph 5, he moves on to say, the results of this corruption is that the humans and humanity became inventors of evil, insatiable in sinning, not able to get enough. And the reality is, at this point, the race of the humans was perishing. And the human being who was once made rational and in the image was disappearing. The work made by God was being destroyed. And he says, this situation is not okay. He says, on one hand, it is absurd that God should be proved lying. Why would God be proved lying? Well, God said, of this tree you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the wages of sin is death. And so he must be put to death. Now, on the other hand, it was improper that what had once been made rational and partakers of his word perish and return to non-being through corruption. And also, on the other hand, it was not okay for humanity, which was once made in the image of God, now to be destroyed. So the question that he asks in the dilemma is, what should God do? Can he allow them to die, to be corrupt and to die? And he would ask, well, what was the point in creating them in the first place? Is right, it is right for God not to allow humans to perish because it would be improper and unworthy of the goodness of God. Now, can God ask for repentance? Well, this would still make God go back on his word. And, and as we said, the verse is, in Genesis 2, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, it you shall surely die. So, and then again, repentance would not change the nature back from what has already been corrupted. So, he comes to the point that only God is able to recreate the universe is worthy to suffer and to intercede for all. And so now in paragraph eight, he sums up and he says, for this purpose, the incorporeal, incorruptible, immaterial word of God comes into our world. So once again, it's important, the three adjectives that St. Athanasius uses to describe God, incorporeal meaning without a body, Incorruptible cannot be corrupted or uncorrupted, and immaterial also um, not in a form of immaterial, not bound, not limited by immaterial. Now, this God, with all these adjectives, without a body, or was incorruptible and without a form, now he has to come to the world, and obviously in a form of a body. So he, God comes into the world. Why? Because he, he's going to list a bunch of reasons. Number one, he says, foreseeing the rational race, perishing, people were perishing, death reigning over them through corruption. It was absurd for the law to be dissolved before being fulfilled. 
seeing the creation being dissolved, the excessive wickedness of the human race, and that human race is headed to death. He also adds, having mercy on our race, having pity on our weakness, condescending to our corruption, having power over death, and to save the creation of God. He says he comes down. There, for the word incarnation, there are many words that St. Athanasius use. One of them is he takes to himself a body not foreign to our own. What does God do? What is the point of God becoming man or taking the form of a man? That he may deliver it to death on behalf of all. He offers it to the Father, doing this in his love for human beings. On the one hand, with all dying in him, the law concerning corruption in human beings might be done. We spoke about the verse, verse Genesis 2, 17, where of the day you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. So how does this fulfill this? Well, by the death of Christ, all of us die in him. And now, on the other hand, to turn human beings from corruption back to incorruptibility and to give them life one more time life from death the only way to reverse the corruption of the human race was by dying but god is immortal and he cannot die so this is, this is for god to take a body capable of dying and god offers this pure body as a substitute for all as we said the very corruption of death no longer holds ground against humans human beings because of the indwelling word and it this reminds us of the scapegoat in leviticus chapter 16 and all the sacrifices that involved a pair sometimes when you read the old testament you find a, a sacrifice required two two doves two goats two pigeons two of each and what happened was very interesting one will be sacrificed its blood sprinkled on the other and the other left to go free it is a type it is is a type for what to happen it is pointing out to what will happen it is pointing to the resurrection of our lord god and savior jesus christ so from leviticus chapter 16 verse 7 it says he shall take the two goats and present them before the lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now he says, an analogy he's going to use this and develop upon it further he says when a king enters a city and visits one of the houses he brings honor and protection from bandits to the house just like when christ comes to our world and takes a body like ours he gives it protection from death and corruption in paragraph 10 we're going to have a recap and he beautifully includes verses from the Bible that speak to the same um, things that he is speaking to. He moves on with this analogy of the king and he says, If a king built a city and it was attacked by bandits because of the carelessness of the inhabitants, he does not leave it, but he defends it. All what we have said is found in the gospel. All, all that St. Athanasius has said is found in the gospels. Beginning from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, for the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. So Christ died for all of us, and through him all of us have died, and then through him all of us again are granted life. And then in verse 15 he says, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And in Hebrews chapter 2, he says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Really what we're looking for is the last couple of words, 
that he might taste death for everyone. The reason for none other than God to be incarnate it is also found in chapter um, in Hebrews chapter two verse ten. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are th are, are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. The Logos took a body as a substitute. And we also find this in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And as much as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through human beings, death came about, and also through a human, the disillusion of death and the resurrection of life in Christ. 